of Horatio Alger and the entrepreneur, and, and these people become icons. You know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, the Google guys. Um, there's this whole supporting infrastructure, the culture, that supports this. And, by, and so what we realized on this trip was that we need a similar system for social entrepreneurship. We don't have that system. It's been now, in the time from that trip, it's slowly starting to develop, but we don't have uh, fluid capital markets. As one of the things you've learned, you know, it's hard to get the right financing base. It's also, I think now you can generally get startup money if you have a good idea to be a social entrepreneur and you're willing to make a big sacrifice, frankly, starting out. Um, but it's very hard to get growth capital. It's almost impossible to get scale capital. And ironically, as you get bigger, it takes more and more of your time to raise money. Um, uh, we don't have the kind of institutional support. I mean, this course is a break. But it's one course for 60 people in a university with you know, 5,000 undergraduates. There are starting to be social entrepreneurship, social enterprise programs. Eventually, there should be degrees. I mean, we have degrees. You can get a, a, a master's in business administration. Why not a master's in nonprofit administration or in social entrepreneurship or social innovation? We need that across the country. We don't have a media that is fluid. We don't have like the social entrepreneurship page or even the nonprofit section of the paper or magazines, et cetera. Again, there's, once in a while, there's coverage. And the government's role has to dramatically change. Uh, and it's interesting, because Obama's on to this. He has a new Office of Social Innovation in the White House. There's a new What Works Fund in the Department of Education. It's interesting you talked about education. One of the things Obama wants to do is really help drive change in education by supporting social innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a new Social Innovation Fund as part of the, the Kennedy Serve America Act, which we've worked on. Uh, so we need to build that system. And I think if we could build that system, then we could get to be as dynamic in the social space as we are in the private space. And people you know, should grow up you know, wanting to be the next Wendy Kopp, you know, who's created a revolution with Teach for America. I'm sure if I asked you, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows somebody who's applied to Teach for America or knows somebody who's doing it, for example. Or be the ne next Jeffrey Canada, or be the next Dorothy Stoneman who started Youth Bill, for example. Um, so we need that system. Uh, and we can talk more about that. Um, I came back from the trip. Went back to City Year, uh, got inspired. The other thing I learned from the trip is, and somebody asked this question, this is a global idea. Service is not unique to the United States. It's everywhere, um, all over the world. There are traditions of people doing service. Uh, and that was one of the things I wanted to discover. You know, could this be a global movement, not just a, an American movement? And, and it is. And uh, came back to City Year. Uh, one of the things that I worked on was helping to bring City Year to South Africa. That's a whole other story. But, uh, and was just working on growing City Year and trying to get it to scale. Uh, and then the turning point for me was six years ago, there was a crisis in the AmeriCorps funding program uh, overnight. Now, the way AmeriCorps works, which I think is part of the reason it's been successful, is it's not one big federal program. It's not like the Peace Corps or VISTA, um, where you apply to the federal government, the federal government runs the program, it chooses everybody, uh, and it's one sort of one model. What AmeriCorps did, what the, what the breakthrough was with Clinton, partially from you know, us working on it and other social entrepreneurs who'd already been involved, is that AmeriCorps is more like a foundation. It's like a government funding vehicle. It sets the standards, the rules of the game, some requirements. But there are now 2,000 plus AmeriCorps programs across the country where the federal government is basically providing resources. There has to be matching funds, et cetera, so that you can have different models. You can have things that are tailored to local needs or national needs. And I think part of the reason AmeriCorps is now 75,000 people on its way to 250,000 with the Peace Corps kind of stuck at 7,500 is that it, it is that more dynamic model. It's, it's, it's leveraging and building off of the entrepreneurial energy and the energy that's in the nonprofit space already. So what happened was in June of 2003, the day that they were supposed to announce the grants, instead they announced there's going to be an 80% funding cut overnight, out of the blue. And it was not because a single program had done anything wrong. It was because of partisan politics in Washington. There had been a group of people who'd been trying to kill AmeriCorps from the beginning. Um, for various reasons. It was because of mismanagement at, at the federal level. And ironically, it was because of September 11th and an upsurge in applications and the president saying he wanted to grow AmeriCorps by 50% in response to that and to response to people from your generation saying we want to serve the country. Uh, and then the person at that point running it, over-enrolling, and then Congress not passing the budget on time, so they didn't get the money they thought they were going to get. It was a perfect storm of just, you know, it's a textbook case of, of Washington messing up. So in response to this, I'd been in the movement for 15 years by that point, and got together with some friends with Wendy Kopp from Teach for America, and Dorothy Stoneman from Youthbuild, and Jeff Canada, and uh, 
John Gompertz from Experience Corps, Michelle Nunn from Points of Light, and others, and said, we've got to turn this around. Um, and so we ultimately did a big grass tops and grassroots campaign to save it. We got 44 governors to write a letter bipartisan. Um, we got 150 mayors. We got 200 university presidents. We did a full page of the New York Times, donated to 250 business and philanthropic leaders who'd said collectively they'd invested a billion dollars in matching funds and the government needed to keep us going. Um, but that didn't do it. What did it was a grassroots effort where, uh, you're probably too young for this. Any of you seen the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? Okay, a couple of people. Um, it's a great movie. Have you seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life? A couple of people. Anyway, uh, what we did was we, we tried to think of a dramatic way to show the value of AmeriCorps. We couldn't get people in Congress to pay attention to this. So we essentially organized a citizen's hearing. We said we got a room in the Senate and a room in the House for 100 hours straight. We went round the clock and had people come in from all over the country. We had over 700 people come in from 47 states, all the way from Alaska to Mississippi, everywhere. Uh, and they came in and they testified. We actually ended up going 108 hours because so many people wanted to testify. And then they went and visited their members of Congress. We had school teachers. We had AmeriCorps alums, Peace Corps alums. We had some mayors and governors. We had business leaders, philanthropic leaders, um, faith-based leaders, community-based leaders. And we got a lot of media attention from that. And the result of that was, and then we went and saw people in Congress. The result of that was we got half the money back for that year, enough to sort of keep the program going. And then we got all the money back, plus a $100 million increase, enough to grow the program by 50%, which is what President Bush had originally promised the following year. So it was a big victory for the service movement. Um, but my job was not to run that campaign. My job was to run City Year. So I went back to running City Year with Michael. But the following year, a year later, even after all this work and all this support, the program was cut again, not by 80%, by about 10 to 15%. Not enough to raise a big ruckus. And then it was cut again by about the same amount, and then it was cut again. So uh, I'm watching this. I'm coming up on having done CDR for 20 years and then realize, you know what? I'm ready to do something else. Um, and so started Be the Change, inspired by Gandhi, who said, you must be the change you seek in the world. And Gandhi had a threefold strategy for building democracy, the ballot, the spinning wheel, and the jail. The ballot being your political rights that you get just by being a citizen in democracy, right to vote, right to free speech, assembly, etc. The spinning wheel being service, and Gandhi thought people doing daily acts of service was essential. Uh, and then the jail being civil disobedience or mass citizen action. I had done the spinning wheel for 20 years, and I finally realized after the Save AmeriCorps fight and then seeing what happened, that we needed to get the service movement and the social entrepreneurship movement more engaged in the ballot and the jail, more engaged in policy and political activity and advocacy, and more engaged in mass citizen action. And so started Be the Change. First, and what we're trying to do is, is different campaigns around big issues. Started with service, it was natural. Did this campaign called Service Nation. Launched it with a big summit last September 11th and 12th. We were able to get Obama and McCain to come and a bunch of people, uh, leaders from across the country for the next day to basically say we need a new commitment to service in this country. Worked with Senators Kennedy and Hatch on new legislation, the Serve America Act. And then launched a grassroots effort. We, we had a coalition at that point of about 100 organizations. Now it's up to 200. And collectively, this coalition then organized the Day of Action. Two weeks later, we had 250,000 people participate in 2,700 events. And then we did a, an ongoing advocacy effort, which uh, led to, and, and uh, then Senator Obama, both McCain and Obama came on the legislation and said they'd support it as president. And just last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, President Obama signed the Serve America, Kennedy Serve America Act, which is now going to take AmeriCorps to 250,000 people and set up a new social innovation fund and all this other great stuff to really take the service movement to scale. Um, so I did that. And with Be the Change, what I'm trying to do is similar campaigns. Look, learning what I learned from Save AmeriCorps and from studying Gandhi, doing grass tops and grassroots outreach, trying to build a coalition, trying to get the consensus. The interesting thing about the Serve America Act is the ideas came from the field. We spent nine months bringing together leaders in the service movement, saying, if you were in charge, what would you do? And, and then we fed that to Kennedy and Hatch, and they were very open to that. We want to hear what the experts, these are the people who are the experts, think. And the legislation very much tracks the policy agenda that we put out at our summit. Uh, and so, and now I'm ongoing with that. The next big thing that I want to do, and it's interesting, a number of you mentioned it, the idea of inequality, opportunity. The next big campaign is going to be Opportunity Nation which is really an effort to, you know, American dream, land of opportunity. How do we make that real for everybody? How do we try to close the gap in, in inequality? How do we fight poverty? Similar kind of method. 
build a coalition 